Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this presentation, Making Active Learning Work. We have two chat options today, one on the right-hand side screen and one in the blue bar below the video. To best organize questions for our speakers, we would like you to use the chat feature in the blue bar for that purpose, but we will be monitoring both chats for your questions and comments. Please participate today in the session by sharing your thoughts, posting links to resources, and or asking your questions. If you are asking a question to the speakers, please use a question mark at the beginning of this question. So this makes it easy for us to scroll through and identify your questions. Now I'd like to hand it off to our moderator for this session, Shelley Winans, and we'll get started. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining this session on active learning. I'm excited to introduce our three presenters today. We are joined by Abba Ahuja, Academic Program Director at, Minerva, at the Minerva Project, also Associate Professor of Natural Sciences at Minerva University. James Janone, Managing Director of Minerva Project and also Professor of Social Sciences at Minerva University. And Chris Wilkinson, a student at Minerva University. I'll turn things over to them to talk about making active learning work and tell you a little bit more about themselves. Thank you so much, Shelley. Uh, we'll just each, I think, introduce ourselves again in a little bit more detail. Um, I'm James Chinon, as Shelley said. Uh, I am a professor at Minerva University and also a managing director at Minerva Project. And um, just by way of a little tiny bit of background, uh, Minerva University, for those of you who don't know, is a undergraduate degree granting university accredited uh, quite recently by WASC, initially incubated through the Claremont Colleges. And I've been uh, associated with Minerva um, initially through the university for around six years. And a few years ago, moved over to Minerva Project, which is a, a separate company that helps to incubate and build a lot of the educational practices and technologies that we use at Minerva University and now use in academic partnerships with quite a number of educational institutions globally um, in high school, higher education, and professional learning and executive education. Abba, would you like to go next? Sure, excellent. Thank you, James. Um, so I also uh, have been uh, at uh, Minerva University for close to six years now. I'm an associate professor in the natural sciences, where I've had the opportunity to uh, design and facilitate active learning courses, particularly in STEM, which is my disciplinary background. And uh, more recently, I've also been working at Minerva Project, where I work with our partners, uh, international as well as US institutions on implementing our active learning pedagogy on our virtual platform. So it's been uh, exciting for me to take what we've been doing in our virtual classes. Um, also, I've had an opportunity to facilitate active learning um, in our traditional brick and mortar classes at Harvard Medical School before I came to Minerva. So it's always fun to compare the experiences um, and I'm sure I'll get a, a chance to talk about that more today as well. And I will pass it along to Chris. Yeah, and um, hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris and I'm a student at Minerva University. I have been a student for three years now, so I'm going into my final year. Um, I'm an economics and philosophy major, but have had experience in computer science as well. Um, so essentially I can speak to more how the active learning environment works from a student perspective and what it's like to be on the receiving end of that. Um, in a past life, I also was in a brick and mortar institution. Um, so I have had the experience of both um, kind of the traditional and then the more active learning base. So I'm really excited to explore some of those with everyone today. Great, um, thanks both. And so I think we can get started now. And um, uh, our, our goal for this session is to talk through uh, a couple of different aspects of how at Minerva we've implemented active learning in this virtual environment that we created. And um, now, you know, after the last year and a half, um, many people have gotten used to uh, what we've been doing for, for about uh, eight, eight years uh, total that the university has been, been running uh, of, of teaching 
uh, in this medium, synchronous classes using video conference technology and so on. Um, and there are some, some particular ways that we've in implemented this that are largely based on, on learning science. So uh, w one aspect of what we want to talk about today are, are the pedagogical principles from, from that research on, on how people learn uh, that underpins the active learning approach to facilitation that we've used. And then second, once you sort of have those principles in mind, what are some of the techniques that we use to actually create engagement with students uh, in, in a virtual classroom? And then finally, uh, as much as there's the sort of live learning experience, there's also um, how students can receive feedback in order to uh, continue to learn and grow um, based, on, based on what they're, they're focused on in the given courses. And so we use quite a bit of formative assessment at Minerva, and um, that's a component of active learning for us as well. So those are kind of our three main topics, and we'll spend a bit of time on each. We'll spend some time um, showing you the technology we use for this, but of course, much of what we say will apply, you know, regardless of what kind of um, platform you use. And even though we're, we're focusing on virtual teaching and learning, um, it's relevant also, as, as Abba said, in, in a brick and mortar classroom as well. And the way we're going to do this is uh, in a kind of interview style. I I'm going to be the, the interviewer and I'm going to ask some questions of uh, Abba and Chris uh, about each of these topics. And of course, we welcome your questions as well in the chat and we'll, we'll pause at various moments to, to see uh, if there are questions uh, that, that we want to address, that we can address. So um, I think I'll start Abba, by asking you to just explain what we mean by active learning in the context of the work that Minerva has been doing over the last several years. Yes. Uh, th this image here is, is, a, is a good way to start this off. So this is a picture of a classroom. Um, what's going on? The students look like they are engaging uh, in some type of problem solving task. Uh, they look like they're discussing some data, some graphs. Uh, we have a student who's deep in thought here. The other students uh, are reacting using some smiley faces. There's something going on in the chat. And I like to contrast this with what happens in a lecture-based class where you have the lecturer, the instructor at the center, at the front of the room, uh, pacing up and down, talking at the students. Right. And so what's happening in an active learning classroom is that the students are at the center they are actively engaged in constructing their knowledge, applying their knowledge, they're doing things as opposed to passively listening to an instructor. And that really is the crux of it. And this can happen in a brick and mortar classroom or an active learning classroom. And here we're showing you how we do it at Minerva in our virtual class. And so Chris, I wonder if you could say a little bit about what your experience of this has been like and in particular to maybe draw the contrast between um, how it's different uh, in a virtual environment than it is when, when you're learning face-to-face. -face. Yeah, I can definitely speak to that. And I think a really helpful analogy that I've previously heard of, it's, it's kind of like a game of ping pong um, where you are constantly going back and forth between the professor and between your students where you're essentially building knowledge together within this. So most of our classes are discussion based, very similar to kind of seminars, but everyone is contributing at different points and building on what's being said. So you're not just kind of making a point and it exists within a silo. Um, I would say something and then the professor would kind of ask the question back and then that would go back to the class and we would expand on that from there. And I think in comparison to previous kind of more traditional and I guess lecture based where you are just sitting and kind of consuming that information, there's no kind of time to really interject or to really kind of seek to understand what is being discussed and build on at your own pace what is being discussed from there. So I think this idea of kind of ping ponging going back and forth between student and professor and student and student um, really kind of epitomizes the, the active part of the learning experience at Minerva. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think to dig a little bit deeper on this, it's helpful to embellish a little bit more on the image on the screen. So what you see there is a, is a static image 
of you know a couple of videos and uh, then some small thumbnails of other videos on the top and and that's actually a, you know an interactive learning resource. I think um, it's a it's a Google Doc, although uh, Forum now has its own version of of such uh, such kinds of learning resources. But the the classroom is actually dynamic, so um, you can rearrange that main part of the screen in a whole number of different ways. You can feature other kinds of interactive resources, whiteboards, videos, you can drag different student videos onto the screen. And, and in a class session, you know, an hour or 90 minutes, however long it is, um, what's on the main part of the screen is constantly changing and updating dynamically based on whatever's going on in class. So we have lots of the kind of activities that Chris was just describing. Um, and some of them are ping pong, some of them are basketball, some of them are soccer to extend the analogy. Uh, and this dynamic nature of it is really engaging to the attention. Um, so maybe just to build on, on, on that, Abba, could you talk a little bit about um, what it's like to facilitate a range of different kinds of activities uh, in a classroom like this, um, as opposed to you know, sort of working through a slide deck if you were lecturing? Yeah, I love that. And before I even talk about facilitating, just as you're designing this class, right? Um, when I'm designing a lecture class or a set of slides, it's about what am I going to say versus a class like this, where I'm always asking the question, what are students doing at this particular moment? So that's what guides the design and then the facilitation of the classroom. There is a lot going on when you're facilitating a class like this, as, as you were saying, uh, the main stage is changing, the specific activities are changing, you're bringing in different students. Um, and so what is really useful is to have a highly structured lesson plan and lesson experience where you really, uh, and we'll talk about some of these learning principles shortly, draw on different learning principles in a way and construct activities in a way that uh, keeps students engaged and maximize their learning for the amount of time that they are in the classroom. Yeah, that's great. Um, and Chris, how do you prepare for a learning environment like this differently than you might if you were going to listen to a lecture? I think there's a couple of different ways and some of them are kind of preliminary and then some of them are during. So I think typically when we do active learning, we do go off more of a flipped classroom basis where students are coming to the class with some level of knowledge of what is going to be discussed. So everyone's kind of on the same page. And then when we come to class, students should be prepared to discuss and build on each other's ideas. And to kind of reiterate what James and Abba have been saying, that the class structure um, can facilitate that in different ways. So um, speaking to both of my disciplines in economics, which is something which is typically very visual and obviously requires a lot of graphs. Um, we can have images on one side and we can have students on the other side and we can point two directly different parts of a graph and different points there. And then in philosophy, in the entire juxtaposition to that, we may just have a whole host of students on the screen at one point. And that allows you to engage into like a topical debate where you can see the reactions and engage with it from there. So I think there is a, there's two parts of this. of so first kind of coming into class, already having a, a level of understanding of what is going to be discussed within the classroom but then actually seeing yourself as a participant in building that knowledge and not just being someone who is kind of sitting there and receiving that knowledge from a lecturer, I think is probably how you would best prepare as a student. That's great. Thanks so much for that. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more now, I think, about uh, some of the evidence that supports active learning. And, and Abba, maybe you could say uh, something about this evidence and, and how it's effective for different kinds of audiences and contexts? Absolutely. The, you know, the research and the evidence for active learning uh, is mounting, has been building, I would say, for more than a decade now. Uh, largely comparative, comparing uh, you know, the traditional didactic lecture classrooms to courses or sections that are taught via active learning. So you know, sections that are taught where students get um, repeated regular problem solving, data analysis, higher level cognitive tasks. And, and these studies have consistently shown that active learning is associated with improvements in student outcomes, starting with increased interest 
in the content and the subject matter, when students are actively engaging and discussing with their peers and processing, uh, that's been shown to be uh, across, across disciplines. So we're talking uh, STEM, we're talking accounting, sociology. So really across disciplines, uh, we find this evidence for active learning and also across institution types from uh, four-year universities to community colleges. Uh, increase in sub increased interest, improved academic performances, differences in letter grades in sections of the same course taught via active learning versus via lecture uh, pedagogy. And what's, what's really interesting and important here is also these improvements in academic perf performances are actually disproportionately higher in students from economically, educationally disadvantaged backgrounds, leading to a reduction in achievement gap. And this was in a community college, um, large scale community college study. And finally, not only do these effects uh, happen in the specific courses and the sections where active learning is taught, but these uh, effects are seen in the future trajectory of these students. So higher three-year graduation rates, higher rates of persistence in students who had more experience with active learning in their freshman year. So really the data is pointing towards the effectiveness of active learning in improving student learning and outcomes uh, in a variety of different ways. Great, thanks for that, Abba. And um, I'll just say that in a moment, we can pause for uh, some questions if, if people have them, but while we're letting people uh, think about their questions, if they wanna add any in on this part of uh, our presentation, Chris, I'll just ask you, you know, Minerva University is an incredibly diverse uh, university. We have uh, around 600 students and they come from, I think, over 70 different countries. Um, you know, what's your experience of how um, active learning has influenced how um, students kind of integrate and uh, interact with each other in, in the environment that, uh, especially in a virtual classroom, you know, Minerva is a, a residential university, so people live together, but what, what's the classroom culture uh, when you have people coming from um, such different backgrounds uh, in the context of active learning? Yeah, absolutely. I can speak to this. And I think it is something when you initially come to Minerva, it is something which is quite exciting, yet it seems quite daunting to have something which is very hands-on, very active and very intense with people from a range of different cultures. Um, but I actually think active learning is very appropriate in supporting that. Um, because it establishes everyone on the same page, but also you can see and you can interact with each other um, within that space. So kind of going back to the previous slide where we had different people within the window pane, um, you can see the other students and you can see each other's reactions. And when um, students make a good point, for example, um, we have like lots of different emojis which can appear on the screen. And um, these like smiling emojis are like a, a click of support emoji. And these kind of little acts really encompass everyone kind of coming together and supporting each other within that. And I think this comes back to the point that I was saying earlier, of when you enter an active learning classroom, you are all collectively helping each other build on each other's knowledge. And you get that level of intimacy that comes through with this, despite it being on a virtual platform. Um, so it's been incredibly exciting. And I think what is also nice for me is it does kind of continue on to the offline experience as well. Um, but it is something which is very heavily impacted within the virtual classroom and having those little microtransactions between students that you can get. Yeah, that's great. And, and something I observed um, teaching Minerva students and also observing students from other universities, you know, we've, we've had partnership programs that teach using this pedagogy um, at quite a number of different countries and types of institutions globally. And one of the things you see is that, you know, students start in very different places. And by even the end of one semester, you know, they're all prepared to show up uh, and engage. Um, in, in the learning process. And because they have so many opportunities to practice and try and fail and so on, they get really used to that. And then the kind of feedback that we get from their employers after graduation or internship managers, things like that, is that you know relative to their peers who have mostly experienced 
um, learning by lecture and exam, they have a kind of intellectual maturity in the workplace that's unusual for uh, people who are either still in college or, or just recently graduated from college. So I think that's that's another part of the, um, the outcome of active learning that maybe hasn't been studied as much yet, but that is uh, something at least anecdotally we, we observe. So I'll pause here to see if there are questions that the, the moderators wanna uh, bring to the front. Nothing at this time, although there was an article shared about the impact of active learning in STEM, a link in the chat. Great, thanks for that. Well, um, this is not an active learning session, so we won't call on you, but uh, we welcome questions throughout uh, the rest of, of the session, but we'll, we'll move on for, for right now. So we wanted to talk now about uh, some of the, the learning science, not the research on active learning, but the research that underlies it and that uh, sort of generates the principles uh, for designing it. Um, and this is based on um, a chapter in, in a book that was written about the, the building of Minerva University by our founding dean, Stephen Coslin, who's a um, cognitive psychologist who's written quite a lot about learning in his career. And he uh, looked at all of the research on learning and organized it under these two broad maxims. And then under each maxim, what you see are uh, different principles, 16 principles of active learning. And so um, uh, I'll, I'll just briefly say you know, about the two maxims, and we won't go through each one of these, but we can, we can talk them through a bit. Uh, the, the idea of thinking it through and the maxims that fall under that is the idea of uh, actively applying information or knowledge. Um, so rather than kind of passively receiving it and trying to memorize it uh, uh, in, in the way that you might if you're um, sort of taking verbatim notes, you're actually putting the knowledge to work. And by doing that, um, it's, it's a way of uh, improving your learning. And um, the second maxim of making and using associations really has to do with connecting bits of knowledge to one another. So, you, you know, you, you come into any learning situation with an existing store of knowledge, and as you're learning new things, making those connections is a way that you solidify uh, the new thing that you're learning and also make it relevant to, uh, to your existing body of knowledge and help you know when to apply it. Um, so what I want to ask now, um, you know, Chris and Abba, maybe Chris, you can go for this first this time. Can you give an example of how one of these principles uh, under one of the two maxims shows up in the classroom? Yeah, definitely. And I think, again, to kind of go back to Abba's point originally, if this is something which is effective within the, the virtual classroom, but can be done in a physical space, um, I think two which I really use quite often um, within my disciplines of first, like inducing dual coding and then secondly, promoting chunking. Um, inducing dual, dual coding, excuse me, um, is massively important within economics. Um, I think being able to have the visual code, but then also the written code and the spoken code. So if someone explains to me, for instance, this is what the principles of supply and demand are, and they have a supply and demand graph behind them, and are also kind of providing writing on what supply and demand is. Um, that is enacting a series of dual codes for me, um, which helps me really understand what is being discussed. And then the chunking element, this is more how classes build on top of each other, um, so in a series. So chunking is very similar to how we learn a phone number. You don't learn all 11 digits, you learn them in like a three, four, three, or whatever, and um, this is how we construct a lot of our classes where we will first kind of understand the underlying concept and then we'll provide an example of it and then we will go further within that. So this is something which I've found immensely helpful in philosophy when you're breaking down key concepts like, okay, what is consequentialism? For example, having it broken down into core fundamental elements as opposed to tackling it head on um, is something which has been really beneficial and again is supported through the active learning environment. Yeah, that's great. And, and uh, there's a question in the chat, but before we come to it, Abba, could you say a little bit about how you might use one or two of these from a, a course design and active learning design perspective? Yes, I'm happy to do that. And I'll maybe try to tie it in a little bit to the question that's come in, in the chat as well and we'll, we'll build on it. 
Um, one of my favorite ones is spaced practice. Uh, the idea of being structuring uh, student learning in such a way that there is a wait time, right? You're introduced to a topic. Uh, for instance, uh, at Minerva, we have the flipped classroom approach. So before the student comes to class, they do the readings, answer a few study guide questions. Uh, that's round one. They come to class uh, and they are now uh, applying some of their uh, reading, some of the concepts that they uh, uh, were introduced to in their reading in their classroom discussions. Uh, and then again, in a few weeks, they're going to revisit those concepts uh, in upcoming lessons and those assignments. So structuring the learning in a way that students come back to concepts helps to essentially consolidate those memories uh, and those ideas in their brain. So that's, that's one example. Uh, I think this ties in with the idea of how can you build asynchronous online courses? Uh, these principles are fundamental universal principles of learning, right? They, they, they rely on what psychologists and neuroscientists have learned about how the human brain can remember things and process things. So using these principles, one can certainly think about constructing asynchronous courses that are more effective um, and more active in that, again, students would be engaged in more higher level cognitive tasks as opposed to watching someone, uh, you know, lecture at them in a video in an asynchronous course. Um, I'm starting this answer, but I'm not fully answering it. Uh, James, more thoughts on active learning and principles of science in asynchronous courses? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the keys and the reason why there are 16 principles here and not just two maxims is because uh, the, the variety of different approaches here really mutually reinforce each other. Um, so I think, um, you know, just to pull on a few more, um, uh, interleaving, which goes really nicely with space practice, is the idea of um, switching back and forth between um, different content areas or different kinds of tasks and so on when you're learning. And uh, what the research shows is that uh, you learn better if you do this than if you just stay for a long, prolonged stretch of time just on one topic area or one um, modality of learning. Um, and so you put those two things together and now you think about the different modalities of learning that there are. Um, there's something like reading a text or watching a video, and then there's doing practice problems. And then there's maybe, if you're in an asynchronous uh, modality, um, contributing to a message board, right, where people are asking and answering questions about the course content. Um, and then, you know, you might have a, a mini assignment, like write a short blog post or something like that, where you're actually having to think about how to apply what you're learning to an, a concrete example. And now you start doing these things and uh, that interleaving and that space practice, because you do them over a stretch of time, uh, start to have their impact of, of consolidating um, the, no the new knowledge in your memory. And now you can introduce some other things as well. So um, over on the right side there, we have this idea of create associative chaining. Um, and associative chaining is basically narrative structures. So when you start finding ways to learn things um, through storytelling, through um, even associating uh, that knowledge with uh, a particular kind of narrative of how, how the different you know, concepts in a theory fit together or something of that sort, um, you know, it, it becomes uh, a lot easier to, to learn it. And that's why uh, examples, stories uh, are so powerful in, in learning. Um, so, you know, when we do, uh, when we teach sessions, uh, on actually the science of learning. Um, one of the things we do is we do them active learning style. And then we ask people to think about which of the principles did we just put into practice in one of the activities that we did. And uh, what they always notice is how many of them are relevant in any given activity. Um, so I think uh, that's one of the really nice things that you can do when you're thinking about curriculum design, whether it's for synchronous or asynchronous, is how do you put some of these different principles together in order to, to create a classroom? So let me actually move even into a more, yeah, go ahead, Abba. Yeah, go. I, I wanna just jump in on one more point around the asynchronous online versus the synchronous online. In my experience, the real challenge with the asynchronous online courses is the social presence aspect. As, as you saw in our first slide where we had that image of the students, uh, even though they are online and they're in a virtual classroom, there is a lot of interaction that's occurring 
instructor student interaction you know we're having a discussion the instructor is listening nodding giving feedback and saying that was great build on that a little bit more the students are interacting with each other whether it's in the chat or with the emojis or as chris was saying just sort of the exchange of ideas in real time that's the element that uh, is obviously very challenging in an asynchronous class making students feel the sense of belonging in in a classroom in a course and certainly there's some ways like message boards as james was saying is there's ways to create that sense of community and that uh, sense of belonging but that's that's the challenging piece yeah that's great i'm glad you mentioned that and um, one of the interesting ways that you can do that is uh, using video and film. So, you know, I took a, a course a couple of years ago um, where it was a hybrid course as, as our, uh, you know, we think of our Minerva courses as being like that, where one of the kinds of um, assignments we had between the live sessions was to actually make short videos of ourselves explaining a concept that we were learning. And then we would post these and then people would sort of leave comments and, and critique them and so on. And then at the end, you got to write a reflection kind of assimilating all of the feedback that you got. Um, and this really, I thought was a great active learning uh, ac activity because you both had to uh, use uh, the generation effect of like actually applying your knowledge while recording this video. And then you had to analyze all of the feedback that you were getting. You had to give feedback to other people. So analyze what they were doing. And then you had to synthesize and kind of tie it all together and figure out, you know, what would you have done differently based on all the feedback that you got? So, um, and, and not only that, by, by both, posting your own video and watching other people's videos, you did get to know the people uh, in a different way than you would, I think, in a, a traditional, really only self-paced uh, asynchronous kind of class. All right, so we can give, give an uh, even more detailed example of, of how this works. Um, so this is, uh, this is peer instruction. And maybe, Abba, I'll just ask you, can, can you talk us through how peer instruction works and how it's applying some of the different principles that we were just talking about? Sure, I can, I can start by walking you through what's going on uh, in this image here. Um, and as James said earlier, this is a static image of a live, uh, you know, video synchronous classroom. But what you're seeing here is uh, we have our classroom of students and in the top left, you can see two poll questions. So we ask the students uh, a poll question. Uh, and as you can see, this is a fairly uh, complex questions. Students had to consider a few different options, vote for one. And then they went out to, a, then they went into a breakout room where they were in small groups, deliberated the answer, debated the answer, and then they had to come back and answer that same question again. And you can see that the pie chart has changed. Some students have changed their, their original response. And that's what they're doing in peer instruction. They're engaging with the question. They're engaging with different viewpoints, different evidence, and coming to a conclusion. And so what they're doing in this, once they've come out of the breakout now is their instructor uh, is asking them, why did you change your mind? What made you change your mind? Who still uh, wants to vote for yes versus no? Um, and so that's, that's what's going on here. So many principles <laughs> that are, that are in, in effect here. We're talking about generation effect, right? This idea that the students, they did some work before class, they're coming to class now, pulling all of that information again from their brain, deep processing, really thinking through what is the question, considering alternates, considering justification. So deep processing is a big one. Um, and then deliberate practice, sharing their response, getting some feedback from their students, maybe changing their response, maybe elaborating their response better. Uh, th th those are some really big ones. I'm sure that there, there's other ones as well, but a lot of different principles being invoked here as students are engaging in this activity. Um, I'm gonna try the risk of doing a little bit of uh, active learning here in our session and use the chat and just ask um, if, uh, how many of you here, and you can just type yes in the chat if you've done this before, have used a technique like, like peer instruction where you have students kind of, um, think pair share is like a kind of another related one. And I'm just kind of curious from, from the people who are in the session, if you're familiar with that or if you've done it. Oh uh, yeah, good. We're getting the chat waterfall effect. I love that. Um, that's great. So yeah, I think this is a, you know, when, when friends of mine um, from other universities and so on, ask me, you know, what's a way I can start incorporating active learning into my class? This is a this is one that I propose all the time. And Chris, since you've done this a lot, I mean, what's it like 
to engage in in an activity of this kind from the student perspective and and what's this, how does your sort of thinking change as you kind of go through the activity I mean, I think there's quite a lot to pick out there. I think the first thing is it, it's quite intense. Um, it is something very different from kind of passively receiving that information. Um, but I think that is a reward to it. You are actively listening to others on what their reasons are, on what their understandings are, um, and then kind of listening into what they are saying and then kind of breaking it down and going through and understanding it yourself. I think there is definitely... A lot more reflection which seems to happen and this is also kind of within like the different contexts as well um people will bring up points coming from different aspects of a certain question that you yourself might not have considered and i think this kind of social element where you're continually building upon other people's points and you're kind of going back and forth and debating them um links this point that james was making earlier about having that emotional intelligence and that kind of emotions to understand and how to interact with others and that maturity that comes through from here um so it's, it's definitely something which is very intense but i think it is something which is very rewarding in itself um because you are hearing multiple perspectives uh multiple different views and often if it's something that you're not understanding yourself so if you've kind of come into the classroom and you're not 100 percent sure on the concept um having a student explain it to them to you, sorry, in a way that makes sense to them is incredibly powerful, I think, because not only are they probably explaining it to you in terms that you are more familiar with, but also having another student explain a concept to you is far more beneficial for their learning than if a professor was to just kind of explain that principle again using the language that they have kind of learned it through themselves. So I think it's, it's an incredibly rewarding experience. And I think as I've always kind of saying, there's so much kind of active learning principles which kind of come up here and it's very difficult to kind of say, these are the ones specifically. So I hope I've kind of hit a couple of off and hopefully given a bit of a, a broad encompassing um, view on peer instruction there. Yeah, that's great, Chris. So go ahead, Abba. And and I wanted to make, take a few more minutes to make a plug here for, doing this virtually, doing these types of very layered activities and tasks in a virtual classroom versus when I've done this in my, you know, brick and mortar classroom. I, I used to run a small seminar class again, about, you know, 20 students ran a tutorial for uh, first year medical students. And we would do a lot of peer instruction. The amount of time it would take to just get things set up uh, you know, chairs are moving, uh, they're shuffling around, students are, you know, walking across the room trying to get to one place, I'm giving instructions to one group and then, you know, running over to the other one and clarifying things. And now I can basically click a button and students are in their groups, the instructions are readily available to them, everything is streamlined, they can retrieve all of that information after class, I can give them feedback on that after class. And so it's just much more streamlined and efficient to do these things online than it was when I tried doing them in the physical classroom. Yeah, thanks for that. That's one of the really nice things I think about the way technology is advancing right now, um, spurred in part by, by COVID, although you know, Minerva's had a platform for doing this for, for quite a while now, is that you know before I came to Minerva, uh, when I was teaching at Rutgers University, um, I taught a flipped class using active learning, and I had no fewer than six different pieces of technology I used to, to teach the class. Um, and they, they weren't integrated in any way. So, you know, there was a lot of work in spreadsheets kind of on the side to uh, plan and uh, capture kind of the feedback and, and um, measuring student performance and so on. So the fact that we can integrate things now and kind of have a very cohesive experience for students, I think um, really matters a lot. Um, I noticed there's a couple of comments coming into the chat. Yes, whiteboards as well. Um, Make, make a big difference. And one of the nice things we built is rather than just blank whiteboards, we use a whiteboard as an annotation tool. So we're often having students draw on um, text and graphs and things like that um, in the classroom, which works uh, really well. Um, so there's a question about, is the setup for using the poll question difficult to put in place or is easily accessible? Um, is it done inside of Zoom as a poll? So we have our 
own um, proprietary platform that we built, which is called Forum. And that's what you're seeing here. And it has an entire backend to it called Course Builder that allows us to create these very structured activities uh, for our class sessions. So as an instructor, um, you have a kind of run of show that's available to you where at the touch of a button, you can reconfigure the classroom for the next activity. And that's part of what makes the, the classroom really dynamic. Um, and that's you know what allows us to set up things like polls and just easily run them um, and show the results to students and so on. Um, and the neat thing about that is you can also do it on the fly. You know, If you can see that everyone's confused, for example, you can just create a poll really quickly and have people type out their, their current confusion or their question that they have, or you can run a, a yes or no poll and so on. Um, ah, this is a great question for Ava. Uh, how can you uh, effectively address the potentially increased cognitive load demand with active learning? Actually, maybe you can each take a shot at that, but Ava, you wanna go first? Sure, I agree. That's a great question. Um, and, and yeah, and I can certainly answer from the instructor facilitator point of view and would love to hear Chris's uh, student perspective after that. Uh, yes, the cognitive load for designing and facilitating an active learning class uh, is significantly higher. Again, I think technology can help in some ways. Our platform, we have tools that can ease the cognitive load in some ways. James was just referring to uh, being able to set up the, le the lesson in advance. And so when it comes to launching a poll or uh, launching a whiteboard, putting up a collaborative editing document, those are some things where we can actually ease the instructor's cognitive load. And those things can come up relatively easily. So now the instructor is really focusing on what is my what did my students say? Now I can take that and respond to it and say, okay, this part was great, but now I wanna call on another student to build on the second part or connect it. So yes, the cognitive load is, is definitely higher on the instructor and we wanna use technology as much as possible to uh, to, to reduce it, at least for the tasks that are less important as we're engaging with our students. Yeah, I like to say it allows the instructor to really focus on where their own expertise as a subject matter expert and a facilitator lies in really listening to students and helping to direct them to you know what they most need to pay attention to in order to actually learn. Um, so yeah, Chris, what's your, what's your experience of that with the cognitive load during class and how does it impact your learning? Yeah, I think I think there's two points to this. Of the the first of I think it is something which does kind of depreciate over time as you get more used to this. I think with Minerva being based around active learning and being based around flipped classrooms, initially it is quite a a cognitive hike, I guess, to swap from a very passive to an active kind of basis. But this is something that we do. Um, you know, in, in every class. And this is something that I've been doing for three years. And I think it is something that you do naturally adjust to. Um, there is just a little bit of time where you kind of have to step out of that comfort zone and be, okay, this isn't how I'm used to being taught, um, but I'm going to need to give this a go. And I think the second element of it is is the social element, um, which we've been referencing a lot more, I think, um, students are very supportive of each other. Um, the nice thing is because it is a flat classroom, everyone is kind of coming in with a, a decent same understanding of the content which is coming through and um, students are there to build on top of each other. Um, there's no kind of one superstar student who wants to excel on top of each other. That's not really the culture that exists within there. Um, but also the student professor relationship, because as you can see across the top, like the professor is one window pane amongst all of the other students. Um, there is a lot more of an acceptability of kind of asking the professor for help and asking for their understanding. Um, you can't really see it in this kind of image, but we do have like a hands up emoji. So if I have a question, I'm able to click something on my computer and a hand is raised and then the professor would be able to ask. Um, and obviously that isn't something which is best facilitated within a lecture style. Like if you're sat at the back of a 500 person lecture hall and you've got your arm up, um, I highly doubt the professor's gonna call on you from there or you have to kind of take the steps all the way down to the blackboard at the front um, to ask the professor a question. So I think with the 
the size of a classrooms and because there is so much a focus on discussion and kind of working through ideas with both other students and with the professor um, the cognitive load is is unburdened because it is shared out and it is something where everyone is kind of there for the success of each other as opposed to it just being here is a set of information it's now your job to deal with it um i hope that answers the question no that's great and it actually gets at a question that came up in the chat, which uh, asked, do you have processes in place to ensure that all students have equal uh, chance to participate? And the answer is yes. Uh, another beauty of a virtual classroom that you don't get in a live classroom is that you can record when people unmute themselves and speak. Um, so we can track the talk time of students and we have tools available in forum that just allow you as an instructor to kind of hit a hotkey and you can see um, the relative amount that each student has spoken during that class. And then you can also track it over time. So it helps you during class to kind of facilitate and get students involved because that's part of active learning, right? They have to participate in order for them to get the benefits of those uh, principles, the learning science principles um, put into practice. Um, and so it helps you to ensure that, it helps you to overcome you know, the biases, the implicit biases all instructors have. For me, it was like, I, there were certain students I never wanted to call on because I knew they were going to say something very confusing. And I wanted to call on like the students who I could rely on to like explain it clearly. But that totally defeats the, the learning process. Uh, you know, we want everyone to, to get their chance to, to apply their knowledge. And making those mistakes is such a huge part of it. And I think, you know, that's what I love about the peer instruction when you see people changing their minds. Right. I mean, to me, that's what it's all about. It's realizing that you were wrong. And um, through this process of, of applying your knowledge and talking to your peers and so on, um, you come to, to a better understanding of the material. Um, and that just becomes normalized, right? It's not about just getting the right answer on the exam, uh, whichever way you can by cramming or, or memorizing or whatever. It's about thinking it through each time uh, so that you know how to get the answer reliably. Uh, whenever you come up to a new example and making sure that you participate and that participation is equitable is a really important part of that. Well, maybe we'll move to uh, a kind of last section here and uh, talk a little bit about formative feedback. So um, we spent some time saying, you know, how active learning uh, is applied in the classroom through these activities. Um, and, and what you're seeing here now is what happens after class. So in our classroom, uh, every session is recorded. Uh, so we get a recording of the, of the uh, actual you know, conversation discussion that happened during class and also of the poll responses that people made and so on. And then we have this assessment tool where you can watch the video and look at the poll responses and you can leave feedback. So you see, if you look uh, carefully on here, um, the little, words on the right side with hashtags next to them. Those are our learning outcomes. Uh, we mark them all with hashtags to make them easily searchable and more memorable and so on. So what the instructor can do here is select one of those learning outcomes and decide to give it an assessment. Um, and so you see the number three. So we have a rubric based system where you, you get a score one through five uh, using you know a rubric that the students are aware of. And then you can leave a comment um, here and that's what you see happening. Uh, so all of these comments and pieces of feedback are collected for the students, they have access to them, and they get repeated pieces of feedback on the same learning outcome, um, not just throughout a class, but even across classes. So one of the really unusual things that Minerva University and a number of our partners has done is that we introduce a set of foundational learning outcomes in gen, gen ed courses taken in the first year, and we continue to assess them uh, across courses throughout the student's entire journey. Um, and we not only assess them kind of in obvious places where they would apply, but also in unobvious places, because we're looking for students to kind of transfer their knowledge across contexts and domains. Um, and we evaluate that as well. So students actually don't get uh, the final assessment on their freshman year, first year general education courses. They don't get their final grades until they graduate. And those very last assessments on the gen ed learning outcomes are recorded in their final project. Um, and this kind of technology to do the assessment in this way uh, is part of what allows us to do that. Um, so maybe I'll ask um, uh, Chris, you know, how does this form of assessment sort of support your learning and what's your experience of it been like? Yeah, I can answer this. And I guess I can first also provide what I would see 
Um, because obviously this is what the professor would see as they are marking an individual class. Um, for me, so when I go into the learning environment, um, I have a list of kind of outcomes which I have been assessed on. Um, so those rubrics that James was speaking on, I have access to my personal um, scores and I can kind of go through and look and see where I have received feedback on each one. Um, I think the best thing about this is realistically is a form of deliberate practice um, where I am getting feedback on the specific part that I have said. So like even this point that I'm making right now, if I was in a Minerva classroom, um, Abara James could choose to grade me on what I'm saying right now and they could say, you have made some excellent points here. Um, and the thing that's really nice is I can do something with that feedback. And I think one of the frustrations that a lot of students um, and even previous frustrations of mine have had is you typically get feedback at the end when you can't really do anything about it. You'll have like a paper, you'll get your marks and then it's like, okay, this is really great feedback, but I have no way to apply this again. Whereas because we are continually assessed in this formative fashion, you can understand what you did well or not so well and see how to either improve that next time or how to sustain it as well. So it's actually actionable feedback, which I think is something which, which is incredibly valuable. And once again, it is a little bit odd at first when you're like, oh, I'm getting feedback on pretty much everything I say. Um, but slowly it becomes part of the norm and um, it's something that you come to expect. And it is genuinely rewarding as a way to kind of improve over a semester having that formative feedback continuously. Yeah, that's great. Um, and Abba, I wonder, um, how would you say this form of assessment differs from the kind of holistic letter grading approach that um, is, is often taken in, in higher education? Yes, it, it makes my job easier in many ways, right? Uh, I remember when I was doing, you know, teaching, training, uh, classes, the, the, the guidelines were always be specific, uh, as specific as you can when you give students feedback. Uh, but when you give a holistic grade, it's very hard to be specific. And so what this allows you to do is you're immediately targeting your feedback to a very particular learning outcome. So it allows the student and the instructor both to be very targeted. Um, and then the more specific you can be, and then when you use a rubric, a predetermined rubric that, as you said, is visible to both the instructor and the students, uh, it takes a lot of the subjectivity out, right? You're not second guessing yourself. You have a clear rubric. Um, and actually rubrics have been shown again to uh, reduce biases. And so anytime that you're able to be specific and use a standard uh, tool for measuring, because again, a lot of our courses at Minerva are team taught courses. You have multiple sections of a single class being taught by different instructors. And so having these rubrics, having these clearly defined learning outcomes, which everyone has a shared language for, really helps us to calibrate and make sure that students are getting a consistent experience and consistent feedback. Yeah, that's great. Um, and there was a question in the chat about uh, how much time this takes, uh, which is, of course, variable. Um, but Ava, do you want to say something about that? I do. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, it takes time, right? Giving thoughtful, actionable feedback to students takes time. But again, I want to say the time is spent really on thinking about what, what can I give to the student right now that, as Chris has been saying, the student can work on and improve as opposed to, you know, just spending time doing like a checklist of, okay, this is one, this is two, uh, adding up <laughs> totals. Uh, the way that I can do it is a very uh, targeted and systematic way. Yeah, that's great. And I think, um, you know, Part of how at least I think about active learning is that um, the assessment is much of, as much a part of active learning as the you know teaching in the real live classroom time. Um, you know if you don't close that loop by giving students some indication of of how they're doing and where they're at, um, it's it's hard for them to orient um, toward what they need to focus on. And one of the benefits of of giving the assessment on a per learning outcome basis is they start to see their areas of strength and weakness. Um, so you know they might have a learning outcome around 
um, writing thesis statements and, you know, be really good at that. But when it comes to, you know, their composition style and their word choice and, you know, um, parsimony and those sorts of things, they, they might have some real room for improvement and they can see that in a way that is harder to get at if all you get on the, on the essay was a B plus with maybe a few comments in the margins. Um, uh, because uh, the nice thing about organizing by the learning outcome is that all of those comments and bits of feedback are organized in one place. So you can just click a button, you can see all of the reactions you've ever gotten to the thesis statements you've written over time. Uh, and that's, I think, quite powerful uh, for learning. So we're coming up to sort of the last five minutes here and you know we'll kind of summarize and wrap up, but if there are, if there are last questions that people want to ask, um, you know, please go ahead and keep, keep putting them in the chat there. Um, I'll, I'll take a shot at kind of summarizing and, and tying together some of the threads here. And then Abba and Chris, I, I invite you to do the same. Um, I think when I go back uh, to the beginnings of Minerva and um, Abba and I both joined after there were only about 30 students at Minerva who had been there for one year. And then we kind of came in the second year and uh, redesigned the experience based on everything that had been learned from that first year. You know, I, what impressed me the most and why I wanted to join on and, and engage in this kind of systematic effort was um, how uh, organized we were, how intentional we were about putting the principles that we shared a bit earlier into practice throughout a curriculum. Um, so this isn't just a course here and a course there. You know, it's an entire educational experience that's designed around this. And in fact, it has multiple components. Um, so you can be quite ambitious about this. There can be the asynchronous parts of class, the pre-work and so on. Then there's the live parts of class. And then we even have for our students experiential learning opportunities where they're going out into the world and engaging with employers and things like that. And those experiences are constructed around the same learning outcomes in many cases that they're engaged with in the classroom. So again, it's this kind of space practice, it's interleaving, it's knowledge transfer and so on. Um, so you start to think about a, a really um, cohesive, integrated uh, learning experience that is really reinforcing and, and concretizing knowledge. Um, and part of what the virtual environment really allows you to do and where it's most powerful is in the data. Uh, the data about how students are doing and about their engagement so that you can see you know, over time if a student is finding a way to hide uh, in the classroom and not participate, you can see that becomes visible. You can reach out to them, you can help them get unblocked and whatever's holding them back. Um, and then you can use that, that assessment to really um, allow them to focus on where they most need to, to improve their learning. Um, Abba or Chris, do you want to, to add anything to that by way of uh, summary or wrap up? I can let Abba go first and then there might be like a final little bit, I guess, from a student side, but I feel like Abba might have a bit more insight. I, I think Jane summed it up nicely from the from the teacher uh, perspective. Uh, Chris, take it away. Yeah, I think, um, I think the only thing for me is just that virtual learning does get a bad reputation. And I think especially under the guise of a pandemic, it has really had a bad reputation because I think it's something where we have extracted um traditional learning and tried to fit it into zoom um and i think the key factor of making virtual classrooms really work is being intentional in how they are designed and having that active learning intent and i think as the comment section has shown here as well and i think as what we have tried to show if you go for the principles first um this is something that is easily implementable with resources that are free like google classrooms zoom um, Microsoft Classrooms as well, and then using like Kahoot or whiteboards, for instance. Um, yes, Forum is all whistles and bells and is very nice and really excellently facilitates that. Um, but I genuinely think if you embody those kind of principles that we spoke about earlier, um, this is something that you can implement from the get-go and from a student experience. And as I say, from someone who has been to and had a brick and mortar education experience and then come to this, um, I genuinely highly value the active learning experience and would really encourage anyone who is kind of unsure of whether they should dip their toes into it um, to just dive straight in. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, I'll, I'll build on it briefly by saying that, um, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, I wrote a little uh, short article called The Hard Part of Online Teaching is Not the Online Part, um, It's the Teaching Part. And the same, you know, the very same things that, uh, you know, work well in teaching in a face-to-face -face classroom and that will really improve student learning, uh, work well in a virtual environment and can even be enhanced by it. Um, I think a lot of the experience that 
uh, Minerva instructors and instructors who use our platform will say is they never get to know their students better than they have in this environment um, because it removes some of the, the sort of physical uh, barriers that you have to, to actually engaging and interacting um, in this way. So I think we've come right to the end now. Um, uh, thanks so much for your attention, for your questions and comments in the chat. Um, our emails are here. I think the slide deck, uh, if it wasn't already posted, it will be after the session. Um, I think we'd all be happy if you if you reached out to us if you had questions or, or wanted to discuss uh, what we've been up to and what we've been sharing here further. Excellent. Thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> thank you everyone for attending this session and a huge thank you to our presenters and moderator. A session feedback survey should be popping up and we would really appreciate you taking the time to fill that in as our speakers do enjoy receiving your feedback. We did record this session and it will be available soon for asynchronous viewing. Please join us now for a fun networking social to close out the day. Thank you all.